Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Blades, Professor of Political Science, and um, I'm also here as a faculty affiliate of the King Center on Global Development. I'm delighted to welcome um, an amazingly large audience here today to hear um, about the amazing work of three women who are um, seeking gender justice in the world and have been activists uh, for this cause for many years. So the Stanford King Center is dedicated to stimulating research to alleviate global poverty and inform policy on critical development issues. So this requires a multidisciplinary, multifaceted approach and the center focuses on supporting large scale faculty initiatives as well as emerging scholars from across Stanford's seven schools. The King Center also convenes stakeholders from across campus to engage in discussions of policy um, and also to try to coordinate across both private and public sectors. The King Center speaker series features talks by distinguished scholars and policymakers. The goal of the series is to foster discussion about the successes and challenges in the field of poverty alleviation and development. Today's discussion is being recorded and the recording will be available on the King Center website starting early next week. So today, we're gonna to be discussing how to successfully build opportunities for women around the world to consider what strategies for empowering women have worked and where, when, under what circumstances. And can these strategies be adapted to work in other places? Each of our panelists today will have five minutes to talk a little bit about their priorities, their involvement with the issue of gender justice around the world, and to talk about what's motivating them in the current moment. Then we're gonna have a more open-ended discussion where we're going to have some questions that were pre-registered with those of you who sent in your questions in advance and also um, the opportunity to have questions submitted through the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we can um, try to address some of those questions in real time. I apologize if I'm not able to get to everyone's question. So um, you may have noticed that all three of the panelists that we have today are connected in some capacity with Global Fund for Women. Global Fund for Women envisions a world where movements for gender equality and gender justice have transformed power and privilege from the few to the many. And we're gonna have um, an amazing opportunity to hear actually from the founding president of Global Fund for Women, Anne Firth Murray, who is also a consulting professor here at Stanford. Then we're gonna have a chance to hear from the current CEO and president, um, Latanya Mopfred. And then we'll turn the discussion over to Mozan Hassan, who is a founder and executive director of Egypt's Nazra for Feminist Studies. And then we'll open it up to a broader discussion. So um, we're gonna first hear from Anne. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, King Center, for inviting me to uh, participate in this panel. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, especially with the Global Fund sisters, that's very nice. I'm going to read some notes that I wrote because I was just looking at some old materials and I came across a little booklet that I wrote on a vision of empowerment for women. And I thought well, that would be interesting, perhaps. And so let me read a little bit, and then, then we'll chat and interact, I hope. Uh, in, the, in the 1980s, some of us working on international development activities were thinking that the then current way of thinking about development issues was too often effective. And we needed new actors, primarily women, and others to enter that field. There were many groups out there, we knew that, affecting positive and impressive change. And we knew that a great number of them were women's groups. This was the real realization <clears throat> um, that, that motivated us to begin to uh, create a new organization, uh, the Global Fund for Women, which would be dedicated to strengthening the position of women in their societies. The Global Fund would provide grants to hundreds of women's groups around the world, and it would do it in ways that would encourage freedom, creativity, and flexibility. The organization was based on a vision of mutual trust and respect and a belief that women within their own cultures knew best how to proceed. From the beginning, we had the idea that although financial assistance may be important for effective international work, um, perhaps more important were the relationships that could develop, relationships based on a set of values that recognized women's wisdom commitment and dignity. In the early days, I was not concentrated on women. 
a short answer to that question um, is this. We concentrate on women because such a concentration is both important and right. Women worldwide within the family provide more health care than all official health care professionals combined, yet they suffer disproportionately from pre preventable illnesses related to poor nutrition, lack of basic education, and lack of access to primary health care. In many countries, women are the primary food producers, and yet they have lacked training to make maximum use of resources. Uh, in developing countries, and these statistics are possibly out of date, probably about 10 years out of date, uh, not much change has happened. But um, in developing countries, uh, as I noted in this, point, in this little article, two thirds of women over the age of 25 have never been to school, uh, 130 million more women, adult women and men, cannot read or write. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say? Perhaps more, most important here, um, we wanted to introduce a women's perspective, the values and eth ethics that have come from women's experiences. Um, we wanted to introduce this into the field of international work. Um, um, and uh, they're greatly needed as we attempt to make positive change in the world, we felt. Um, the Global Fund for Women was founded in 1987. By 1989, an effective mechanism had been set up to give away um, money with as little hassle as possible, as little administrative hassle as possible. Systems were developed that provided for clear and rapid communication as well as accountability. It was necessary to describe program areas and we concentrated on female human rights, which was our overarching interest, uh, female human rights. And I can talk a little further about that. And women's access to communication and encouraging communication among women's groups. Finally, people, when we were putting together the Global Fund for Women, I spoke to a number of people in the field and they said, you can't put together a women's organization without looking at economic autonomy. And we included that as our third little area of interest. But over time, our, our overarching interest was all, always female human rights. Okay, well, let's see. We hoped not, we didn't want to limit people with our program areas. In fact, we hoped that the Global Fund for Women was, would be the place to which women would turn when they had figured out what they wanted to do and um, could not obtain that support from anyone else. Supporting this freedom of thought and assisting women to come together to share and learn from each other, that very action of meeting, learning, and sharing, we thought in itself was empowering. And maybe we'll talk a little further about that and what we mean by empowerment um, uh, today. Um, I guess the focus on human rights, I just wanted to comment, reflected a central concern with the integrity of the body as a basic human right, um, especially as that was communicated from women's groups we were in touch with, that this was basically important. So we, um, we were uh, hoping to um, uh, take our cue from the women's groups themselves. They considered the work they did, even if it was on education or legal rights or uh, um, uh, health, uh, they named it human rights. And that's why we basically took that, it, that um, category or whatever we might call it as our overarching program area. Over the years, we came to see our work, however, not only in the context of development and human rights, but also as empowerment and further as basic to the health, the actual health of civil society and democracy, democratic practices. The definition, I, the definition I used at the time um, for empowerment was having a vision, having a plan to carry out that vision, and being able to take the first steps toward implementing that plan. And I thought that that's what we were doing at the Global Fund for Women, intervening and responding to women's groups when they needed either to clarify their vision, which is so important to have clarity of vision, uh, clarify their vision or develop their plan, or in fact, take those first steps. Empowerment has also been defined as 
quote, releasing the power that people already have inside them. To, de to do this, to release that power, we believed that it was necessary to, cre to create an environment of freedom where good things could happen, an environment for women of freedom where good things could happen. So that was my little description, and I don't know if I've used my five minutes, but I look forward to uh, continuing to define what we mean by empowerment now, because it could mean almost anything. Um, and uh, here of the more, more recent experiences of women through the Global Fund for Women, both in general and in Egypt, I look forward to the conversation. Thanks. So much, Anne. And going from the origins of the Global Fund to the contemporary, um, Latanya. Thank you so much, Lisa. And it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and I'm like sitting on the edge of my chair, hoping that everything you list out is things that you were hoping to do or things that we've been able to do. And um, and Lisa, you didn't you didn't mention that Mosin is also on the board. She's a board of director of Global Fund for Women too. So we're all connected here. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that so much of what you originally envisioned um, has held true at the Global Fund for Women. And that's not always the case at organization, especially with NGOs that often have to turn their tide towards what donors do. But I do think that the nature of the organization and the mission and the vision has very much stayed aligned with where you were in 1987 and has continued to flourish and to show up. You mentioned, um, you know, uh, empowerment, you know, I mean, look at look at Global Fund for Women is just a classic example of empowerment for women, I think, in every single way. And we can talk about that as we go. But you said that you always took the cues from the field, from women in the field who were doing the work. And I feel like that's why we're where we are now at Global Fund for Women. Um, and so the things that, you, Lisa, you asked about the priorities. Um, there's so many, but I do want to boil it down to the things that I think has been working for us at Global Fund for Women and why we continue to um, stay on task, if that's a good way to put it. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, our major issue right now after having a year of reflection and talking to so many of our partners and advisors and, and um, you know, whether they're resource partners or grantee partners about what's happening and what the needs um, continue to be. And we have landed on a strategy that is focused on movement building. And, and for those that don't use the lingo of, of movement, um, it is really talking about the collective action for social and systemic change. And we've seen, um, quite frankly, um, the research that shows not just the request from the field, but research showing that when there's long lasting social change, it was really driven by a grassroots movement. And you know, you can track that now, you can see um, Laura Weldon, I think she's over in Vancouver now, has shown how you could look at that and how you can cut across um, various sectors um, and see that this um, change comes from these grassroots movements and they're almost always led in some way or another by women. Um, and so gender justice movement building is going to be very important for us, making sure that support to collective action for social change is, is going to be extremely important to how we get our work done and how we get to shifting power and privilege in this world from a few to, to very many. We continue to fund crisis, and that's something that, and I'm not sure how much you guys did it then, but we have seen crises derail gender justice efforts, and so we want to focus in on that. So it's it's around the collective action pri primarily, but of course when crisis happen, and right now, quite frankly, we're living through one with COVID-19, we have to make sure that we get support to these same women's um, uh, organizations on the grounds who often are the ones who bear the brunt of being able to support not just their families and communities, but quite frankly, the entire um, national structure when these things fall apart. Um, but I am happy to say, Anne, that we um, over the 30 plus years um, have, have funded more than 5,000 organizations in 176 countries. And I think that it it is, um, such a privilege to be in this position to be able to leverage a lot of that work that has happened with individual women's organizations concerned with human rights in their countries to now where we're talking about collective action to make real long lasting systemic change. So that's really where my head is. And I know when we think movements, a lot of us think about Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Ni Una Minos, and some of those really sort of groundbreaking global 
um, uh, movements, but uh, quite frankly, movements are always local. They always start local and then they become interconnected. It is the fabric of which a movement is made. And it is how the collective actors begin to challenge their opposition and to move forward. And so we continue to look for that lasting change and we wanna fund that work. Um, but the, the other thing about movements um, is that they're also inter intersectional. Um, and you talked a little bit about this, Anne, but cutting across different themes, right? So feminism in, in general is rooted in intersectionality. And, and we know there's no gender justice without racial justice, no racial justice without um, you know, uh, uh, climate justice. And you know, the list goes on because women's lives aren't siloed in that way. And neither are our movements, neither is the collective action. So in the US, we saw the growing movement for Black Lives Matter was successful and there was a necessary reckoning but it cut across all systemic and deep-seated racism that was going on in the country, whichever sector you found it in. And so we want to be clear and, and show that the evidence is that we have to cut across these sectors. We can't be so specific to one issue. And we talk to funders about this all the time, that we really have to focus on um, the, the, the issues that cut across those sectors and not silo funding so that Women only get it in one area so they can only kind of run and, and, and work in one area. We wanna be flexible so that they can be able to do the things that are necessary to cut down some of those systemic barriers across um, sectors. And so, um, you know, the, that brings me to the other thing, which is intergenerational. Movements are intergenerational. And at Global Fund for Women, we really know that girls have always been organizing. Um, girls have always been working collectively in their communities and pushing back against daily oppressions and imagining new worlds for themselves and for us, right? So girls have to be at the forefront of many of the world's most powerful social justice movements. And um, we have to promote change that happens so that their ideas are much more accepted, that they have a much more um, authentic place at the table than sometimes we give them. And that we have to understand that girls remain extremely vulnerable, so need special protections in order for them to use their power. Um, at the table. And so we're supporting gender justice movements that include young women um, and girl-led movements. And, um, and we have an Adolescent Girls Advisory Council for those of you that know Global Fund for Women or can go to our site and you'll see who these girls are. And they're helping us figure out how we do grant making better and how we move into hopefully I'll be sitting where you are and in 30 years talking about what it was like um, when I was at the Global Fund for Women. But I do want to mention this intergenerational piece before I move it over to Mozen because I think we have hundreds of Gretas out there, right? So we have, um, we lift up some of them in the world press, but everywhere I go, there's some young girl that's actually leading a process of systemic and long-term change. And we have to get behind that, we have to fund that, and we have to support that and lift that up. So I'll end there and, and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Lisa. So um, it's you know the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, and a lot of people have been talking about and thinking about the situation in Egypt. So it's really wonderful we have Mozin here to talk about feminist studies in Egypt and the movement that she's been building. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm really, really thrilled to be with Latanya and, and, and speaking about the glory of Global Fund. And generally, and I'm always admitting this, that I think that we, we in Nazra are the daughters of, uh, of Global Fund. And honestly, me personally, I couldn't be in this position without this kind of support, which Anne has been this, yeah, and describing about the idea of the Global Fund, because when we began before the revolution, as a new generation within our country at, at this time was, we are coming from a region and a country which mainly has been, yani, co the question of women and feminism and gender has been co-opted by someone, someone either the state or some political groups or, or some assumptions about the international movement about who are the real Egyptian women or who are the real Muslim women or Arab women or all of these things. And when we began as a group, I couldn't, I couldn't yani, forget when uh, Zina Zaatari, the program director at this time come to us and she has been discussing with us our idea and they gave us the core fund. And it was for us really the beginning because we were living and we are in our region living in this assumption and structure about 
how people internationally and the resources about us and for us are constructed. So for people we have, while they want to not stereotype women, they sometimes they are stereotyping the movements in certain ways. So we have to be collective that all of us like this, how people are seeing sometimes their second generations in their countries or uh, who are authentic and who are not. But I do think that the model Global Fund has been doing for years, and honestly, this for us has been helping us to begin our movement in this, not only the support and solidarity in this feminist idea, but also this type of grants about the core funding, about how you are leading your movement and how you are choosing how you are continue to do things. And this really helped in this also, the idea as group when we began, when the revolution came, because when the revolution came, things has been changing. We were asking for building a movement because we are group mainly have been built in the idea that we believe that building the movement itself and the existence of the movement itself can lead to any change. So the core is the movement because we can gain in, in region generally some some rights, but because we don't have this stability and this context of so-called democratization or things, so most of the time you can lose it easily. Or people can tell you most of the time that we gave it to you in this certain time, but it doesn't guarantee people after you. The movement is the cool thing to have us have our rights and continue to have it, but also asking for more. And I think this idea, which we, and this ideology, honestly, being a feminist, believe in solidarity and believe in a feminist movement in our country was the core issue to build what we have been doing in the last 10 years in our region and in our country, because we we came 10 years ago at these days, Yani, exactly at these days when Mubarak left that, okay, Mubarak left, so what is after that? And creating a feminist discourse within a revolutionary time or changing time or also understanding the reality, not only the glory, is something so important. So changes are bringing more violence in places which are not stable and democratized from the beginning. And I'm always advocating for this, that building the feminist movement is a tool of stabilization. Not only that we are nice and good and all these also stereotypes about women, but also because we are a nonviolent movement from the beginning. We are the people who are kicked off all the time with all types of violence in the beginning as frontliners. And we understand, we understand what is violence, how the, the violence and the effects of this violence and how peace, security, safety, democratization can help our long-term effect, not also our trend or our glory thing. If I continue in this pro uh, protest of loving Global Fund for Women, I think this idea made us in the last 10 years had an inter different big fights in our country and our region. And I, I'm always saying that I'm so proud to be an Egyptian feminist from this generation who have been fighting publicly and clearly and with all the strength, not only me, but part of this big movement and which is creating continued and building against sexual violence in our country because everyone internationally or any other places can think that it couldn't happen in Egypt this resilience and this type of movement on certain things most of the people seeing it as a taboo or it doesn't suit us as if any yani, other people have rights more than us or any of these things but we did it. We did it that we keep with all the horrible incident happening in our lives personally and politically 
in the last 10 years that this movement is alive. And also that from Nazra learned from being as part of Global Fund family is about building with others and on others, investing on others and with others. This also made that we are, we are a group which is so targeted in Egypt, but at the same time, it's not about us. The movement is continuing. We have been working with people in the last 10 years and we are fi finding them now, they are leading their work. In, uh, in our country and also in the region. So you can find that in different places, the type of building the movement and the resilience we have been building also and the deep solidarity we got. And I have to echo Latanya on this, believing in this intergenerational and solidarity is something so important. So important, not only emotionally as if you want to live as a feminist, but also practically that there are different people who have been building this before you. So you don't have to build from the beginning, just build on it. And this is also something I'm so happy and proud to be here, not only speaking about Global Fund and being with the founding member and the CEO, but also understanding what does it mean being from local, regional, and international. And this is one of the things I have been honored to be with the Global Fund board as in this concept that how we can create our narratives, how how our existence and our voices should be heard and us listen to us. So what's happening now towards the question of how the movements have been building in different complicated places in this region. So look to what's happening to Yemen, how women there and feminists there have been building this movement to be on the table and speaking up there where the first people who called to stop war. And now everyone, because Biden uh, administrative, uh, administration said that they have to stop war. So everyone's now speaking about stopping war. But this war, the call from the feminists from the beginning, how the feminists in Lebanon are trying to overcome all the sectarian violence and all this problematic by having this cause on anti-sexual harassment law. Uh, citizenship law, it's not about the law or the right. It's about how there are certain things are deep. You can have different people on it. And this is the issue about the feminist movement. I don't want to speak a lot, but I think also thinking about those countries as examples, thinking about the Syrian women who are trying to write their constitution now. So having their rights within their constitution is something can bring a, a democratic constitution generally. And thinking about how the movement has been building in Gulf now without, with all the stereotype that those women don't need us. Those women could be feminists by any way, but now we have Lujain al-Hazlul who is temporary out, and we have different feminists from Saudi Arabia who are still in jail because they asked for something so basic for others. But it's important all the time, and I think this is the rule of, of places like this, but also this is how we have been going through the journey with Global Fund that they are listening and it should give the movement the resources to say and speak and, and try. And the core fund is about try, try and don't be afraid. It's not big money and we don't have many demands, but just try and try with this system of solidarity. So I think with all these things and thinking and being proud really, not only to be part of the global fund, but also being a person who can share all the time because I have accessibility more than others, but to understand that this region have many, many, many different women and diverse women and feminist movements like Sarah Ahmed has been mentioning in her book, Living as a Feminist, is something so important. It will enrich the discussion, the understanding. And I'm calling when I'm sitting in any international setting that listen to us and let us put our agenda, our policies, our priorities, and this will be more strategic and really be more right. Sorry, I spoke too much and you didn't cut me off. 
Listen, there's actually a question from one of our registered attendees that I think you would probably be well positioned to answer, which is a question of how to promote women's rights, gender egalitarianism without infringing on cultural norms and practices. And you alluded to this a little bit in your discussion in terms of the listening, the importance of being a good listener. Um, do you have some thoughts for Janine? I think it's also important not to be stereotyped about what's culture, because it's easy. I think one of the good things for me personally to live as a feminist and think as a feminist all the time that it brings me not to be this, uh, what we call it, this black and white person. There are all the time things in between. So culture, that, because we have been this in this in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years as experience in Egypt that you couldn't have feminists local feminists, you are either westernized people or you are those upper middle class women who are so connected to the state. Or you are part of certain political groups, you have the agenda of these certain political groups. And I do think that it's a stereotype. It's a stereotype in a country which from 1919, we have this discussion and these sacrifices about feminism in our country. And honestly, because we came from this positionality that we understand our history, we understand that cultures are not static because societies are not static. And also this can make us Yani, all these years struggling, struggling and honestly fighting and paying prices against the Islamists when they were ruling Egypt, against the securitized, militarized people when they wanted to co-opt our uh, question and our rights and our body, and against such conservative political groups who also wanted to co-opt us. So it's important while thinking about culture to think about what does it mean culture from which group and does it mean if there is something which is common culture that we are not authentic from our countries and honestly the experience brought something else that we have now feminists who are calling themselves feminists and honestly I'm seeing them more radical than me in feminism coming from different governorates in Egypt you have never never thought before the revolution and it's not about that the revolution was good it's about that the opening in the public sphere and the acceptance for new people and people out of the usual suspects to speak up brought those into our eyes. And did you want to say something on this uh, question of culture? I do too, yeah. Go ahead, Anne. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, on that question of, of uh, uh, that, that question of, of interrupting culture or going against culture uh, was raised with me from the very, very beginning when we began the global, oh, you're going in, you're trying to change the culture and so on and so forth. But culture is not monolithic. <laughs> I mean, you know, culture is, is many different things in most countries. And as I explained, we didn't enter, intervene, we responded. We responded to women's groups who were part, after all, of the culture. And as Mosin just suggested, or met, said, it's multicultural, uh, you know, culture is, is a multi thing. Uh, it's made up of many different groups and many different beliefs in any given country. And uh, there, were, there were plenty of women's groups uh, in those countries that were part of the culture. And I'll just add, because um, as Mosin knows, I worked um, for the US government in, in Egypt for, for some years. And, you know, and this was exactly the excuse that was given why we should not support local human rights groups um, from the government of Egypt, right? It was that, you know, this was a cultural issue and um, it was not for uh, foreign assistance funds to be used in those ways. And is, when I look back on my career, um, you know, I definitely wish we had been able to invest more and organizations that would have been able to uh, stand the test of time 
through the Arab Spring, because um, a lot happened, of course, and the support that would be required, and I don't mean just in Egypt, but in any country going through something like this, was really not there for, for those organizations. And it became very difficult for any of us um, to be able to continue supporting that work um, from our, where we sat. And so I think um, we just have to be careful. And I just wanted to, and I think it's the same thing Anna's saying when we talk about culture, um, what we're actually talking about and what we're actually preventing because we've seen our opposition using this so much to the denigration, quite frankly, of women and girls who are trying to do work in those countries. And so I, you know, I want us to, to be careful. I, I agree with Anne, there is no um, room uh, for misinterpreting culture when it is the actual members of society, in this case, women who are leading that effort. And we are following, we're trying to support. And so it's a, it's a different case. We're not trying to recreate culture. We're trying to support groups that are trying to make changes in their lives and, and quite frankly, you know, who are being, um, uh, you know, ostracized for wanting to change certain social systems and structures that continue to put them at the, um, the vulnerability of, of, of the world. And so I, I, I support, um, you know, social change when it's necessary and when it comes from local actors. Latanya, I have a question for you from um, one of our faculty members in the Graduate School of Education, Christine Minwatoka, who's asking um, something that's related very closely maybe to your previous experience in government, which is what types of changes do you think will happen in terms of US foreign policy with the new administration as related to gender justice around the world? And do you have some thoughts on why the US may lag behind other countries in terms of our own gender justice issues, um, women's representation in Congress, head of state, et cetera. Yeah, no, and thank you for the question. I, um, you know, I am, I'm excited about this administration, like I think many of um, us are, um, and, and looking for the opportunities to hold it accountable for what it campaigned for. And in some cases, because it's a continuation of a previous administration under the Obama administration, we do know many of the people and we do hope that we'll see um, significant change. I think where we may have seen in the past that we didn't just go far enough for instance, the global gag rule is just a huge, you know, outlier out there. And that was the Mexico City policy that said that we can't talk about and or refer um, a, a termination of pregnancies in countries where we work, whether we were spending US government money or not, um, has had a huge impact. On, um, on clinics that serve women, in particular clinics in very rural areas where they may be the only healthcare that women are getting. And so what we saw um, basically was that we didn't have enough information to be able to tell the story of how this was hurting women. And we have partners, I know we have uh, the group Rhythm of Life in Uganda, who has been very vocal about how this one US policy has really hurt um, the work that they're trying to do, and she works in HIV AIDS, but she sits by silently and angrily um, and watch girls and women in Uganda die of unsafe abortion. And so that is a US policy that can be changed. We tried to change it permanently in the previous uh, Obama administration and, and just couldn't get it done. And our hope is that we can see that happen now. We should never have a policy in the US talk about culture where we take our anxieties around something and place it on women, girls, governments in other countries and actually uh, remove funds because of that purpose. So um, I do think this administration is, is hopefully going to do well and we certainly wanna support that and we will certainly hold them accountable for what they um, have already said that they can do. But I will say when we talk about why the US is not doing as well as one might think as a quote unquote you know developed country um, when it comes to gender justice um, it goes back to what I was talking about where our you know our intersectional inequalities I mean we have huge issues around race so racial justice climate justice you know there is still half this population in this country that don't believe the climate change is an issue <laughs> So, you know, we've got a lot to um, work on when it comes to these intersectional inequalities. It's not going to be easy for us to get to particip political participation of women if if you can't see yourself being led by a woman of color, right? So it's it's all of these issues um, coming together that continue to keep us down. And once we address these inequalities um, together, I think we'll be able to get to a much better place. And hopefully this administration will be able to start that process and that journey for us. 
have a really important question from a Stanford uh, student named Maria who asks about backlash when you're pursuing gender justice around the world. What types of backlash have you observed in women's communities? What types of strategies might be used um, in the face of backlash to your movements? And maybe we can um, start with Anne. Well, I was, um, I, I don't have a good answer to that question because I have been actually surprised by how little backlash there has been in the areas in which I've worked. I mean, from the beginning of the Global Fund, people often would ask me this. And we would ask grantees um, that were, we considered them and they were brave coming out in, in, in their countries um, for uh, freedoms of all kinds. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised and have been surprised over these many years at how little backlash I have heard of or even, and certainly uh, how little black backlash I have received being a feminist and an outspoken feminist. Uh, Latanya. Yeah, and I, and love to hear from most, and of course, is one who I feel like has been under threat. Um, but you know, I do feel like it's gotten a, a, a bit uh, sophisticated. So you know, governments won't necessarily say, or religious leaders even, um, we have a problem with the progress of women. Of empowering women is a bad thing. You know, so nobody says that outright. But you know, look at their numbers. You know, we talked about the U.S. a minute ago. Um, look at how they treat LGBTQI and trans women. You know, so those are the things when you look at those who are the most marginalized in a community um, that's where you really see the backlash in my opinion and that's how you judge the backlash how powerful it is um, how many people believe in that and subscribe to it and that's the from from where you work where I think it's most challenging though is violence and I think Mosin got to that you know against particularly women and voices we've seen so much of it across the world um, when, when, you know, women have stood up and have resisted um, the type of violence they experience. We've seen it in wars where sexual violence has become the number one, um, you know, uh, attempt to try to uh, change things um, in that regard has been very difficult. Um, and so, you, you know, it is, in, in my opinion, this is the, the kind of things that we have to do is really here from the women directly themselves. And that's why I said hearing from Mosin is so important on this call. And um, we also have, and I just wanna um, make sure people have seen the fundamental film series, which is actual activists from five different countries. And you can go to the Global Fund for Women site if, to see it, but it's called fundamental-film.com. And there's, these are women from five different countries talking about how they have uh, resisted um, and, and how they have come out of it. I think without hearing the stories, it's difficult to understand what women are dealing with and or how they um, actually address some of this violence. And so, um, yeah, go ahead, Anne. Yep. No, I just, I have to swallow all my words now that Latanya has spoken. But when I thought of backlash, I, I was thinking of, of direct um, discrimination mm -hmm. against an individual person for speaking out. But yeah. yes, ongoing, um, you know, especially violence, but ongoing discrimination against women um, may be considered backlash. I don't know, but that to me is just part of our ongoing battle. Well, then. Yeah, I think it's it's so tough, Yanni, to speak about such a thing, but I do think that we couldn't see anything out of the context. And, and the context which also can Yanni, define what is what's backlash, because most of the people I do think that Yanni, what we have been in, in our region, Yanni, and I can speak about my country and some places of our region. I think that all of the time we have a backlash. We have a backlash because we are a movement which doesn't have a back, which doesn't have allies. And this is something so problematic. And, and because of that, we have been living with this also dynamics within the movement that that when one of us can be considered more radical than others, so others could defend themselves by saying that we are not look like her. And this is something of the dynamics of the abused people. And while you are living in a context which is not giving rights mainly, 
it's also something problematic. Yani I can say clearly that I'm a person who have been for years under a, a deep threat and targeting from the state, some political groups, societal groups, and uh, because also it's also about the type of issues you are speaking about because living within a patriarchal conservative society they also want you to look to to be you know this what we call the right good feminist <laughs> this right good feminist could and i don't say that those people are not targeted this is sometimes our assumption that if we can be right good people they will love us or they will accept us more Fa, fa, I think, no, we are living within the southern countries in a systematic backlash. And this is also something about seeing this and seeing the movement alive. And honestly, as someone who's been with me in the movement building for years, I have been thinking twice and three times in 10 years of the revolution, is this movement about bringing more survivals or about protecting more survivals because while seeing the context which is not helping all the time is something make you rethink rethink about how those women are extraordinary I, mean, I am in this thread but i'm thinking for my fellow feminists who are lived in the jails of Mohammed bin salman in three years and I'm, I'm thinking of my friends who are back in my wall now, who are in jail now. It is, it's not about the priority of the backlash, it's about the context itself. The context of accepting this independent movement also to be different and have it, its issues. I think thinking about the backlash is also about the context. So now we are living in a more violent world, generally. We live in a pandemic. We live in in place which is all opportunities are less. Women are facing more, feminists are facing. We are living in a region which has almost two thirds of it have war, war as war. Others have political instability and societal violence. So it is. It's hard to say that we will not face this backlash. I think we have to understand the backlash and also understanding where we should ask not to be more survivals for people to understand us. And this is sometimes it's not the, the power. The power is to stand and say that we need a safe public community and public sphere to work within. And you mentioned the pandemic. We received multiple questions from um, our uh, participants today about how the global pandemic has exacerbated challenges associated with women's rights, the um, encouragement of female labor force participation, but might there also be some opportunities associated with the current moment in the pandemic for the um, movement for gender justice? So um, why don't we start with Anne, then go to Latanya and Mozen, if you guys have anything you wanna say about this question. I, I would have just a, a, a quick response uh, because I really don't know very much about what the effects have been at all, but I do know that violence against women, domestic abuse as it's sometimes called, violence against women has risen hugely in all countries that are, um, you know, noting it, and certainly in this country and in Great Britain where they have actually studied it quite clearly. Um, domestic abuse, domestic violence has, has increased uh, significantly. And why is that? Because women are home alone or alone with their potential abuser or um, who knows, people have to make, have, feel they have to take it out on someone because they're feeling lonely or upset they've lost their jobs, who knows. But the, the basic um, data is that it's increased hugely. Well, Tanya. And I might anything? note that. Oh, I, apologies, oh, Anne. So, no, no, I was going to say that, that, that uh, sometimes people ask, you know, what issue do you think is most important? I think this issue of violence is to me an absolute central issue. Violence is the strategy that people use to maintain control or to increase their control. 
their power. And um, it's therefore a, a, a very, very important and difficult issue. I think it's central to any discussion of women's rights and health. Thank you, Anne. Latanya, well, any um, thoughts on this question about pandemic and the fight for global justice for women? Yeah, and I, you know, and I, I want to um, be respectful of context because we see different things happening in different places. But overall, we have seen that women in, in marginalized communities um, across the world um, have been harder hit, uh, you know, because of the pandemic. But it also makes me. Um, uh, you know, want to, to, you know, realistically say they were the same groups, you know, in 2019 who were suffering the hardest um, in, in their communities. And, you know, and there's, and I agree with Anne about, you know, domestic violence, you know, having been heightened and, and, and almost in, in my opinion, you know, for humanist, you know, in an embarrassing way, um, what we've been seeing with violence in the homes. Um, and issues that have not been taken care of, I think, um, or addressed by our um, governments in, in a long time. Um, but I also want to, you know, just point out the heightened caregiving burden that we've seen with women and, um, and knowing, you know, firsthand and as, you know, many of us on this call um, of what it looks like to be able to hold down a full time job uh, to be able to now do homeschooling when we, you know, when we hadn't done that before. Um, and, you know, and manage all that's happening um, and, and, and then think about that for frontline workers who are having to still go outside the house. A lot of us have close friends who, you know, do have to go to work, you know, they're not sitting on Zooms all day and their kids are home, you know, without care. Um, so I think, you know, all of these um, policies um, are still being thought through, still being researched. Um, but in the meantime, at Global Fund for Women, we know we have to be able to help um, women's groups who are trying to address these uh, issues for their communities. And so we do have a crisis fund um, that we have been able to keep flexible. So our funding, of course, is core long time flexible funding. And so we've said to many of our, our grantees that you use the money for the COVID response as you see needed. Um, and then we've been able through generous donations to be able to offer more funds to women who need additional funds to do different and maybe more initiatives um, in the work. You know, they're doubling down around racial justice and the response from police around brutality around the world. Information, um, so important. Water and sanitation, of course, crucial during a pandemic, but of course also um, providing, um, as I probably mentioned, the, the reproductive health services that have been cut off by many places. Um, and of course, the domestic violence shelters that many women are, are having to, um, to lift up and to include more spaces for women who are experiencing that violence. So yeah. Mosin, any um, particular issues related to the feminist movement in Egypt associated with the pandemic? I think one, one yeah, many problems about the feminist movement in our region and uh, yeah, in our country relating to the pandemic that we from the beginning are portrayed as we are not an important issue uh, and we're speaking about not important issues. So while you are in the pandemic from this movement building thing, you have this double pressure that you are not important. But I think this is something so complicated in entering this gender discussion and gender problems within the pandemic, which became for us, I think that it became for us, all of us as the narrative, the narrative of this world and the COVID then what and what and what. And also there is something politically about this that our people who are ruling in our region are using the pandemic to put more pressure on us as movements. And the people internationally are buying by their will, their arguments about there are many things more than those five feminists who are in jail or those uh, 10 feminists who are in, uh, uh, in travel ban. Why she wants to travel now, there is no one is traveling. Why it's important to have uh, people and offices and uh, movement uh, to exist while everyone is staying at home. So I think this is something about the movement and our context is something so important that people are using this pandemic as privilege on us. And it's also taking from our resources, our resources as a movement and also our resources on the issues. So why do you want now to speak 
about how there is a problem in the rape kits in Egypt. So everyone will speak with you about, we don't have enough budget for uh, the Ministry of Health to have something about the COVID. So it's, it's more complicated in the daily, but at the same time, using it as a narrative for people to get away from their crimes is something so alarming and it will really, really, really affect the movement. And also some people, even from our movements, Yani, as the human rights movement or the development movement have been asking if we are important or not. So now we have to be back to be caregivers or charity people or this people who only give service and yeah, direct services. So why you want to be the sophisticated feminist at this time? So it's more complicated, I think, and it needs many time to see others, but these are my main thoughts of working within this context. So much. So we're running um, relatively short on time and I wanna give you guys each a chance um, to sort of give a sense to our audience of how they can be, the most effective they can be in supporting women's empowerment around the world. Are there any tips, ideas? Are there ways that men can get involved and become allies of the movement? And then if there are any final thoughts that you wanna add as well um, in our last few minutes here as a group. Um, so why don't we go um, in the order we began, which will be Anne, Latanya, and then Mosin. Oh dear. I'm. Uh... I'm not exactly devoid of ideas, but I'm not quite sure what I want to say as a final thing. First of all, there are some chat comments here that are directed toward us, a couple of people who want to be in touch. Uh, we want to perhaps respond to those. Um, <laughs> I, I'm probably going to sound very touchy-feely in what I'm about to say, but I'm often asked, what can we do? What can we do about all of this? How can we... Uh, really deal with violence and all this thing, these things. I think, um, and I say to my students when they ask me this, that the one thing we have control over is in fact ourselves and how we lead our lives and how we interact with people. And as I said, um, I sound rather Pollyannish or touchy-feely or something by saying this, but I think that we need to express kindness and love um, all the time toward people, toward our, our friends, our colleagues, our students. Our, um, and to the extent that we have powerful platforms, um, which I think some of us do, um, we can attempt to do this. Um, and I am reminded, and I'll just, I'm reminded of, of something I tend to quote when I'm asked to speak, and that is um, the def definition of, of love uh, by Thich Nhat Hanh. And Thich Nhat Hanh uh, uh, expressed four mantras that he considered sort of added up to true love. And they've, um, they, they really are guideposts, I think, um, or could, should be. And for me, they, they are. So these mantras were, um, dear one, I am here for you. That's the first mantra. The second, not in any order of importance. Dear one, I see you and it makes me happy. Third one, dear one, uh, I see that you're in pain and that is why I am here for you. And the fourth, dear one, I am in pain, please help me. I feel that those mantras, if we could take them to heart, um, would go a long way toward answering some of the questions that are in the chat, for example, and in trying to summarize what can we actually do Thank you so Who's much for that, Anne. That was really lovely. Um, Latanya. Yeah, yeah, it was, Anne. And I, I think that's the basis of which we have to start. I, I do want, um, for those that um, continue to have questions, to visit uh, us online um, at globalfundforwomen.org. Um, we um, talk a lot about our collective organizing um, rights for workers, for women who are um, uh, working both from home and in other places, and also um, to talk more about um, how do we ensure safe, just, and equitable 
um, conditions for women everywhere. Uh, and I, I do think, and I'll end with this, that we do have, we have a commitment to continue to be educated. I know sometimes the pandemic has made us more insular as a society, as we think about what's happening next door and in our direct communities, but we have to stay educated about what's happening around the world because we are part of a world community. Um, and as, as donors, as many of us give to these issues, um, I think it's gonna be super important for us to understand what's happening and thank Mosin in particular for being able to um, have this time with us. Um, and then think about some of the issues um, beyond the pandemic that will need immediate addressing like climate change, um, like racial injustice. And so keeping all of those things as I talked about the, um, you know, the intersectional inequalities on our mind because otherwise we'll get out of one thing and right back into another. Um, and so um, I, I do think, um, and, and, and that's across the board, men or women, you know, to continue to challenge our leaders on how we address some of these and then ourselves stay educated on what we can do from our own perch to be able to make things better. Thank you for this, Lisa. Well, Tanya, Mosin, any words of wisdom for how to be effective and final thoughts? Yeah, thank you. I think there are, yani, while we are in this setting, I'm always, when I've been within this academic setting, I'm really asking student professors and people who are studying us that they have they can be more engaged schoolers more than this and to understand the movement and the work and honestly i do think that many of the studies and the discussion about our gender movements in our region is really behind what is the reality is happening so i'm really asking people to this and really, really I'm asking you to not to deal with us as interlocutors because we have been spending many hours, yeah, personally I have been spending many hours in my life sitting with different researchers and other people discussing the movement and other things. And honestly, most of those people when they ended their work, even they didn't bother to send me a copy of what they published. And this is something so problematic. It's really so problematic. And I was thinking many times that why I'm spending this time with those people, honestly. But I do think that having our narratives also not to deal with us as interlocutors, uh, deal with us as part of this, and we can produce knowledge. Maybe it's not this academic, but we are producing knowledge because we are doing our interventions based on a logic and theory and beliefs and understanding. This is one of the things. Other thing as, as you in the US have new administration, you have been in this changing. I think thinking deeply about our situation, our region and centers like you and other things to advise the public about also our reality and listen to feminists because it's important because people all the time in the changes the least people they are listening to are the feminists they're coming to the politician the human rights activists the people they are not speaking to us because yeah 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 we will come once and the third thing i think i'm seconding and on this that maybe people don't think that solidarity matter but honestly it matters as a person who have been almost five years uh, in travel ban and this targeting, solidarity matters because this is something really, really important. And I think this is one of the best being a feminist that you know the solidarity and also you know the constructive solidarity. And this is something in this relationship with the Global Fund and others. So. Thank you. I think that um, one of the, the amazing things about these Zoom forums, is they give us a chance to feel that solidarity to some degree. So many questions and comments coming in, people wanting to get involved, wanting to be in touch with you, wanting to be in touch with the Global Fund moving forward. So thank you all. Um, thank you, our amazing speakers, for your time, for your expertise. Thank you to those of you who were able to attend today. The video event will be up on the website shortly. You guys will be able to watch it again if you want or show your friends. Um, and so we look forward to seeing you and welcoming you at a future um, King Center event. Thank you.